Hi everyone, my name is Susie Albanese. I am a resource facilitator with the Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona. I'm also a licensed occupational therapist and an adaptive yoga teacher. Um, so as an OT, I've worked primarily in outpatient neuro rehabilitation, um, working with brain injury survivors, as well as uh, other individuals with various neurological conditions. Um, and my wonderful co-host today is Dina Goldstein. She is the COO, COO and Marketing and Communications Director for Measurability's Home Safety. And Dina brings her 20 plus years of experience in marketing and promotions to the husband and wife owned Measurability's Home Safety team. Dina's primary focus is on community outreach and education regarding the clinically guided fall prevention and accessibility home services that Measurability's Home Safety offers. Dina, we're so excited to have you with us today. I can't wait for your piece of the presentation as well. Um, so with that, we will get started. So for the first part of the presentation, I'll just share a brief overview of what we'll be covering. Um, so we'll talk about the leading cause of traumatic brain injury, which many people may already know. Um, we'll discuss the incidence of fall-related injuries, We'll talk about factors impacting your fall risk after an acquired brain injury, additional fall risk factors for the general population. We'll talk about understanding your specific risk factors and then who might play a role in your specific fall prevention care team. So if you didn't already know, um, we, it's important to share that falls are the leading cause of traumatic brain injury. So fall prevention is extremely critical and a really comprehensive topic. Um, so I would like to start with a little bit of a question in the chat. I'd like to have people guess what percent of traumatic brain injuries would you think are caused by falls? So we know it's the leading cause. And of course, there's lots of other causes for traumatic brain injury. I'd like um, for you to put in the chat what your percentage guess might be. Jay said 70%. Thank you for guessing, Jay. 50%. Let's see if we get maybe one or two more guesses. 75%. Okay. Thank you everyone for participating and humoring me. Um, so according at least to the Brain Injury Association of America, um, the most recent data suggests that falls make up to about 47.9% of the leading causes of traumatic brain injury. So around that 50% mark. So a really huge um, cause. And now we'll be discussing incidents of falls in the United States. So my second and last chat question, I promise, is how many people would you guess are hospitalized each year due to a serious fall-related injury? Um, this is just in the United States, and this is incidents. So each year, how many people would you think this happens to? So over 800,000 people a year are hospitalized because of a fall-related injury including a head injury, such as you know, TBI and or broken bones. Um, so obviously a really large number of people are not just falling, but being hospitalized due to these injuries. And it's important to note that at least one in four adults over the age of 65 falls each year. Um, so the incidence is fairly high and we know that um, age groups for individuals over the age of 65 are at an increased risk for falls as well as children ages zero to four are also at a higher risk for sustaining a traumatic brain injury due to a fall. Now moving more specifically into um, what it might look like to um, have uh, already have an acquired brain injury and what that might look like in terms of your specific risk factors. So due to changes in balance, motor control, sensory system changes, and cognition, uh, those with acquired brain injury may be at an increased risk for falls. So discussing balance first, this is a huge component in fall prevention. And we know that between 30 and 65% of people with a brain injury report balance challenges. So changes in balance can be due to several factors. And this includes muscle weakness, motor control and coordination changes, as well as sensory system changes. So each of these risk factors kind of play upon each other and are relevant to one another. Um, so motor control, this is 
our ability to initiate, direct, and grade purposeful movement. Many times after a brain injury, our ability to control our movements can be impaired as those pathways between the brain and the body can be damaged. Uh, we see this often in brain injuries that affect the cerebellum. Uh, and an example of a motor control challenge might be that you're trying to step over an object on the ground, say your pet, and instead you trip over that pet, or say you go to reach for a pitcher of water and instead you knock it over. So those challenges can make it difficult to keep yourself upright and kind of navigate your environment. Um, now moving into sensory system changes, here we're talking about multiple systems that can be affected after an, a brain injury. In order to maintain our balance and navigate the world around us, we need to be able to organize and integrate information from our visual, proprioceptive, and vestibular systems. And each of one of these systems is largely dependent on the next. And so any impairment in any of these systems will greatly impact our balance and our daily functional performance. So I wanna dive into each of these a little bit further. Um, this could be a whole separate webinar on these various changes, but I'll try to keep it brief. So vision, of course, is one of our um, largest sensory systems. This is where most of our sensory information comes from. And about two thirds of our brain are involved in visual processing. So if there is damage to say the occipital lobe or anywhere along the optic tract, there can be visual deficits such as blurry or double vision, visual field loss, or visual perceptual difficulties such as challenges with depth perception. And these all impact our ability to integrate that sensory information and can lead to balanced challenges. Um, the next sensory system that's really at play here, especially after a brain injury, you might notice these changes, um, is proprioception. So we all have sensory receptors in our muscles and joints, and they tell us where our bodies are in space by relaying that information in those receptors to our brains for integration. So for example, if I close my eyes right now, I know that I'm holding up my right hand. I had to check, make sure I was in the screen, but I know that I'm holding up my right hand. It might look like my left to you, but that's because my proprioceptive system is largely intact. So without using vision, I know where my body is in space. Um, I say largely intact because I'm fairly clumsy myself, um, but if you do have proprioceptive deficits, you might notice yourself feeling clumsy or notice that you're bumping into things more easily. And lastly, in terms of our sensory system changes is our vestibular system. So this is located in the inner ear and provides us with sensory information about motion, equilibrium, and our spatial orientation. And just like the proprioceptive system, the sensory receptors send information to our brains, which help us maintain balance with movement. So impairments in vestibular functioning can present as dizziness, vertigo, motion sickness, and more. Our vestibular system is also closely linked to our visual system. So oftentimes when there is a vision impairment after a brain injury, the vestibular system may also be involved. Um, and just, you know, anecdotally, I see this very frequently after brain injury, and it really does impact someone's quality of life, as well as their ability to, um, you know, maintain their balance navigating the world. Um, and lastly, is cognitive changes. So this is, you know, cognition is, is such an umbrella term, and there are many components in it. Um, I think that there are so many that can increase our risk for falls. Um, for example, attention, memory, impulse control, safety awareness, judgment, and planning. These can all contribute to factors that end up leading to falls. Um, so as an example, I have a family member who has a neurodegenerative disease, and unfortunately, she has sustained several falls. And in kind of um, looking, examining the situation, I know that a lot of it is due to impulsivity and improper planning, especially during transfers from her wheelchair to another surface. So we're always working on strategies to kind of overcome those challenges. But you can see it's a really in-depth, um, complex situation to be dealing with different changes after a brain injury and why, again, fall prevention is so important. 
So moving into um, additional risk factors for falls. So um, these can all be seen after a brain injury, but they're also risk factors for the general public. So if you're someone here who is generally concerned about falls, maybe you haven't had a brain injury, um, these are all key factors to be aware of. So the first risk factor is actually prior falls. A single fall may be an isolated event, um, but recurrent falls, which can be defined as more than two falls in a six month period, should be evaluated for treatable causes. And next is fear of falling. So I always find this one interesting that when you do the research, fear of falling is listed as a risk factor for falling. So this is kind of one of those chicken or the egg conundrums. Did you fall because you're scared of falling or are you scared of falling because you've had a prior fall? And we know that both can be true. Um, however, that fear of falling we know leads to individuals maybe increasing their self-restriction of activities. So as you stop moving and you stop doing things out of fear, it kind of, uh, you know, increases upon itself where then you are more immobile, you may be weaker, um, your flexibility might suffer. Um, so all of these things kind of play upon themselves, leading to a greater fall risk. And the next um, risk is polypharmacy. And this is described as the use of four or more prescription drugs. Um, we will discuss medications a little bit more as we go through the slides. But again, that is just a general um, risk factor. Doesn't necessarily mean that if you're on multiple medications, you're at, you know, you're at a high fall risk, but it is something to consider. And the last one that I'll be discussing um, are other chronic health conditions. So in addition to a brain injury, there are other conditions that can increase our risk for falls. And the most studied and reported ones um, are arthritis, cardiovascular or heart disease, and diabetes. So we're not saying that there's necessarily a causation between falls and these conditions, but there can be a correlation. Just like how the fear of falling may lead to a self-restriction of mobility, oftentimes individuals with these chronic conditions may experience chronic pain or physical inactivity, which we know leads to decreased strength, range of motion, endurance, and potentially balance. So now that we've discussed lots of risk factors, it's important to check your risk for falls. So I'm sharing here a tool from the CDC that is really quick and easy to use um, and allows you to kind of assess your risk. And if you're not able to see it right now, that's okay. We will be sharing the tool in our follow-up email. So for you to really sit down with it and go through it if you'd like, um, but just kind of sharing that this is a good way to maybe start that, um, that process of assessing your risk. And when it comes to understanding your specific risk, um, we know that falls can have multiple causes. Um, a single fall might have multiple reasons as to why it happened, and that repeated falls may have different etiology or what led to the fall. So having a holistic view of your personal risk factors is really important to getting to the bottom of why this is happening. So if you know that you're at an increased risk for falls or you've experienced more than one fall in the last six months, it's really important for you to notify your healthcare provider. Um, and you, you'll also want to seek medical attention for any fall that produces injuries or is associated with any acute illness, loss of consciousness, or abnormal blood pressure. So when meeting with your primary care provider, it's important to go through a thorough history of the mechanism of falls and your personal risk factors. Uh, and again, you can use that CDC tool that we'll send out as maybe a way to begin a dialogue with your professional. Um, some important elements to consider when you're reviewing an incident of a fall include thinking about the environmental factors, the precipitating activity, you know, what were you doing that led to the fall? If it was stepping over the tub to get into the shower, if you were in the living room, if you were getting out of bed, um, as well as the location of the fall. So understanding these patterns, um, as well as your personal risk factors, 
can really help to develop that comprehensive view of the situation. So now I'll be going into what I'm calling your fall prevention care team. So you may have one or more of these professionals on your team. And I will briefly kind of go over what it looks like for each of these disciplines to be working with you in addressing fall prevention. Um, but of course, this is not medical advice. So of course, um, consult with your own healthcare providers for specific referrals and recommendations. So first we'll be going over your primary care provider. So this is who you want to connect with to review your current list of medications. Um, and if you feel more comfortable, you can always discuss these with your pharmacist. I know personally my um, family member loves their pharmacist, so she's always asking about any possible medication interactions. So that's good to know. And again, that's especially important with polypharmacy for those who need to use more than four prescription medications. Uh, and we do know that there are certain drugs that um, you know, can cause side effects that might increase your risk for falls specifically. So just for example, that's sedatives, tranquilizers, and antihypertensive medications, those for high blood pressure. So it's definitely important to monitor your blood pressure if you're on medications for hypertension, um, because sometimes they can lower your blood pressure too drastically, um, which can lead you to feeling dizzy. And it's also good to monitor your blood pressure and consult with your provider if you're noticing any dizziness with positional changes, such as going from sitting to standing, um, as you might need to be evaluated for orthostatic hypotension. Um, and lastly, with primary care, um, taking note of any new symptoms of dizziness or lightheadedness if you are starting on any new medications. So moving on to the eyes. So first of all, ophthalmologist is an important member of your care team. Your ophthalmologist is your regular eye doctor that you should see annually or more if indicated. It's important to replace your eyeglasses as prescribed. Um, as we discussed, most of our sensory information comes from our vision and vision deficits are highly correlated with an increased risk for falls. So your ophthalmologist can provide routine eye exams, vision testing and provide um, prescriptions for glasses. And they can also diagnose and treat diseases of the eye, such as cataracts or glaucoma. And now if you have experienced a brain injury of any kind, um, you may need to see an additional professional. Um, if you're dealing with symptoms such as diplopia, which is double vision or field loss, visual perceptual challenges, um, convergence insufficiency. There's so many functional um, aspects of what our eyes need to do that can be altered after a brain injury. So a neurooptometrist provides this assessment and treatment for, like I said, functional disorders of the eyes. Um, and they specialize in neurological conditions. Next, moving on to physical and occupational therapists. Again, these can all be part of your team, doesn't mean you will need to see every one of these professionals. Um, so these therapists work with individuals who have sustained injury or illness to improve your functional performance in everyday life. They conduct evaluations using standardized assessments and clinical observation to develop a plan of care to address your individual goals. So it may be indicated for you to see one or both of these professionals if you have a new diagnosis, if you have an advancement of disease, a new onset of symptoms, change in functional status, um, and you might need a script from your, uh, your primary care just depending on your insurance. So breaking down a little bit more um, about physical and occupational therapy, um, physical therapy largely utilizes a biomechanical framework, which targets remediation of skills such as balance, strength, endurance, and coordination, which are largely important in fall prevention. And they are also experts in gait analysis, so they can identify and treat any abnormalities in your gait or your walking, which may lead to falls. And then occupational therapy um, this is where they can also focus on remediation of those skills. They might additionally address a little bit of vision as well. 
Um, and they also use a compensatory lens to modify the task, adapt the environment, and teach personal strategies to the individual, um, such as a visual scanning strategy to compensate for visual field loss, um, with the goal of creating kind of that best fit between what a person needs to do and what's happening in their environment. Moving on to personal trainers, as well as fall prevention programs. So um, personal trainers and fitness classes are great for general fitness training. You know, if you're so someone who is comfortable with movement, is active, um, this might be a good option for you. Or if you're finishing up with uh, a round of therapy and looking to kind of stay active, this might be something to consider. Um, so, of course, you'll be working on remediation as well, such as working on muscle strength, endurance, and balance. Um, and that's how that fall risk can be reduced. Um, but, the, you know, they're not disease specific. So if you do have a lot of individual factors happening, it might be worth it to be evaluated individually. Um, and what I think is really cool about these evidence-based exercise um, fall prevention programs is that they are nationally recognized and often studied um, to really make sure that they are doing what they say they do. Um, we know how huge fall prevention is in um, preventing serious injuries. So the fact that people have come together to make these programs is really neat. So briefly, a matter of balance works to reduce the fear of falling, which is one of those risk factors, as well as increasing activity levels among adults. Um, and this is a nationally recognized program. The Otago exercise program is a series of 17 strength and balance exercises. It's actually delivered by a PT or a PTA. And studies show that this one can reduce falls between 35 to 40% among older adults. And the last one I'll mention today is Tai Chi for arthritis and falls prevention, which again is a specific name of a program. Um, many studies have shown that Tai Chi is one of the most effective exercises for preventing falls. Uh, so it helps to um, improve muscle strength, flexibility, balance, and stamina. Uh, we will also share a little bit more information about these programs because um, the Arizona Fall Prevention Coalition has a, a great way of kind of outlining them and showing where these programs may be available in your area. And last but certainly not least is in your fall prevention care team, our home safety and modification specialists. These are professionals who come into your own living environment and conduct an assessment to determine what environmental factors can be modified to reduce your risk of falls and keep you safe. And there are more trip hazards in your home than you may realize. So I will leave the rest of this topic to our expert, Dina, who will be diving in on this momentarily. So before I close out, of course, I want to share how you can stay connected with us at the Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona. Uh, we have our statewide info line. You can reach out to us by email, as well as visit us on our website. Uh, and if you are a brain injury survivor or a caregiver or professional, who is in need of any referrals to local resources, such as neurologists, physiatrists, vision specialists, uh, please know that you can contact us and work with our resource facilitation team for some personalized assistant, assistance. Um, and the last thing I'll share, a little plug for one of our programs called Think Tall, Don't Fall. Um, so this class is specially designed for survivors of all types of brain injury or brain trauma. Uh, and I know that our next session will begin on October 27th. Um, so keep an eye out for that on our website. Uh, and this program is led by Christina Boyd, who is an experienced exercise physiologist. And it uses a series of simple adaptable movements that activate the mind and body for whole brain functioning. So it's a really neat program. I'm actually getting to join it for the first time today. So I'm very excited and we will have Dina continue our presentation. Well, hi everyone. First of all, Susie had some amazing, amazing information. In fact, that's pretty hard to follow. Um, fall prevention is just one of those topics that we we have to deal with and it's, and it's really for everybody. Um, 
Kristen, we can go ahead and advance that. So some of the, the statistics, I'm not gonna read all of them because I don't wanna duplicate. Susie had some really important statistics, but they'll start flying in as Kristen's my right hand today because of my technical difficulties. So we, we know from Susie that one in four of Americans age 65 plus falls each year. Every 11 seconds, an older adult's treated in ER for a fall. Every 19 minutes, an older adult dies from a fall. Um, and this includes anybody that's got pre-existing conditions. This is just overall fall statistics. And as she mentioned, over 800,000 patients a year are hospitalized due to falls, head injuries, hip fractures, and, and, and other, other injuries. And they're the leading cause of fatal injury and the most common cause of non-fatal trauma-related hospital admissions among older adults. We'll have to fly in. There's a couple more. And we know that falls result in more than 3 million injuries treated in the ER. 40% of nursing home admissions are related to falls. And this is a broad sweeping statistic because it doesn't matter if you have a pre-existing condition or not, 40%, this is a huge statistic, end up in nursing at home because they're no longer able to be independent. And more than 95% of hip fractures among adults over 65 are caused by falls. Falls are the second leading cause of TBI, traumatic brain injury. Huge statistics. Susie spoke about that. And it's, and it's a lot of times these are avoidable. And we're going to talk about how that can be. So identifying risk factors is critical in reducing fall-related accidents, specifically at home. So some of the risk factors that Susie covered, um, I'm going to cover as well. Um, and, and it's important. You know that if we're all talking about it, there's something here that we need to look at. So pre-existing conditions which limit or affect mobility, vision, balance, orthopedic issues, have you had a, you know, uh, knee surgery, things that were going on orthopedically that affect your ability to be stable and balanced at home, post-surgery, we're weak, sometimes we don't have the strength in transferring, sit to stand, whether it's on the commode, in and out of bed, or just getting out of that, that recliner in the family room. Cognitive neurological deficits, diagnosis and injuries, TBIs, other injuries that have caused neurological problems that are affecting our balance and our ability to be stable. Disease history, stroke, Parkinson's, again, things that, you know, those people that have, you know, Parkinson's have freezing and, and gait issues and, and, you know, there's impulsivity issues that, that, that Susie mentioned. Previous fall history is huge. Have you fallen? How many times have you fallen? How recently have you fallen? The incidence of fall risk dramatically increases from that first fall. So it's important to pay attention to. And as Susie mentioned, you always wanna mention these things to your, your primary care provider because without talking to somebody, they can't be addressed. Without them being addressed, they continue to be an increasing risk. Environment, and we're gonna get into that. What does your environment look like? I will get into that more specifically later, your home environment, clutter and you know, lit pathways and things like that. Medication, we talked about polypharmacy, multiple meds, side effects, are you dizzy? Are you sleepy? Are you groggy? Are you on so many meds? Or sometimes are you just on one or two that are causing um, your imbalance at home? Hearing, vision, and of course, balance issues. The other thing I wanna add is footwear is really crit critical. We don't think about it. You know, we're coming up on fall and even though in Arizona fall is not that cold, I don't know about you, but my feet get cold and socks and things like that are slippery. So unless we're wearing something with a grip, grippy socks or grippy shoes, it becomes a fall risk, especially on tile and slick wood surfaces. So how do we prevent falls? So there's a great, and I think this is a staggering quote from the American and British Geriatric Societies, a multifactorial risk assessment and intervention strategies are effective in decreasing the rate of falls and have a similar risk reduction to that of other prevention measures like statins for cardiovascular disease. This is huge. This lets you know that these interventions, going to your doctor, physical therapy, you know, evidence-based exercise programs, all these things have such a dramatic effect on fall reduction like statins do for cardiovascular problems. So we talk about getting that home safety assessment, which we'll get into greater detail, environmental modifications. 
Am I having trouble getting up from the commode? Am I grabbing onto the toilet paper holder, which is meant for only a little roll of light toilet paper? I'll talk to you about that later. Transitional care, home care. If you've had an injury and you're coming home from that injury from a rehab facility or hospital, we don't just pluck ourselves from there and go home because we're coming out of a cocoon into an environment that has not yet addressed what happened to us and why we were in those facilities. Primary care providers, medical providers, having that team around, communicating with that team, what's going on. It's not enough, enough to just go in for a physical, how's everything, everything's fine. Well, if you fall in, you need to address that. We don't need to say, you know, it was the dog. There's always gonna be a reason, but after you have several reasons, we really need to address why you're falling so it doesn't happen again, so we can mitigate those falls. Hearing, vision, footwear, medication, and exercise and balance. And now they're gonna get all friendly lit up. <laughs> Just as a reminder how important they are. So um, we can fly these in, thank you. So assessment and evaluation techniques, and Susie you know, covered some of these. As an occupational therapist, she knows that, that all these things need to be addressed. So a fall screen you know, frequency, gait assessment and balance. What's interesting is there's a direct correlation between gait speed, the speed with which you walk and fall risk. The slower you walk, the slower your gait, the higher your fall risk. And so what people don't realize when they're being guarded and cautious, sometimes that extra cautiousness can actually put you at greater risk for falls. Evaluation of your lower body strength, again, gait velocity, you know, how are you sit to stand? How are you transferring to different surfaces like Susie spoke about? Home safety, fall hazards and modifications, which I'll get into, but how are you navigating your shower? How are you getting sit to stand from different places? Are you able to get out of your chair when you're watching TV? All these different ADLs or activities of daily living, things that we do daily that, that might be compromised because we're doing things to mitigate a fall, but they might put us at further risk. Cognitive impairment, you know, we're dealing with a traumatic brain injury or other cognitive issues that affect our balance. Are we, are we experience mental, mental health issues that cause us to not react or have proper balance or on medications that affect our fall risk? Examination of feet and footwear, postural hypotension, Susie talked about, are you, are your roll up blood pressure drop, sit to stand, going from lying down to sitting up, that's important to address, that puts us at risk. Medication review, bone density. A lot of people that are at risk for falls might be frail. It doesn't, it's not necessarily a matter of age, although we do know from research that our bone density speci specifically with women reduces as, as we get older. And so what happens is when we experience a fall, the risk of greater injury, like a hip fracture is even more pronounced. Visual acuity, having your vision checked. Um, it's important to keep your prescriptions up to date, depth perception, our peripheral vision. This all has to do with our balance and stability. Hearing impairment, again, if your hearing is off for whatever reason, you have fluid in your ears, or you might have neurological issues that affect your hearing and your vision, it's important to get your hearing checked. Fall prevention should involve all your providers. That great care team that Susie suggested is really critical. Keeping, If you don't let people know, you can't make changes and you can't continue a safe uh, way of independent living. So ask yourself, so we can pop these up. There's a bunch of questions. Do you use your hands to push up from a commode? Do you rush to the toilet? Do you feel unsteady when you're walking? Do you have trouble stepping onto a curb? Are you taking medications? What are the side effects? Do you have loss of feeling in your feet? Diabetic neuropathy. People with diabetes have loss of feeling in their feet and sometimes can't feel differences in, in surfaces and it causes major fall risk. Have you been advised to use a cane or other assistive device that either you're not using because you don't like it, which I understand, uh, or do you have one and it has not been fit to you properly? So you're bending over, you're reaching. It's important, it's not important just to have something, but it needs to be properly fit. Do you worry about falling and have you fallen in the last year? If you've fallen, 
your incidence of falls goes up. And that great list that Susie showed, we actually uh, hand that out as well. The CD use, CDC uses it. It is a very valid predictor of falls. And so that's an amazing tool. I highly encourage you to go through that when they provide that for you. So if did you answer yes to any of those questions, you could be at risk for a slip and fall accident. Remember, it's important to not only be aware of your risk, but to address your risk factors, vision, hearing, balance, environment. So we have what's called modifiable and non-modifiable fall risks. A non-modifiable fall risk is disease, Parkinson's stroke, heart disease, diabetes, things that affect us that we can't control, traumatic brain injury, other neurological deficits that we cannot control. We cannot control those processes, but we can control the environment that we navigate in. So some of the things that we look at that are really important, stairs. If you have stairs in your home, and even though a lot of homes in Arizona are ranch style, there's some that have a step down or just a couple of steps, and some do have a full set of stairs. You want to always have handrails, something to hold on to. We do not want to do, be doing the Spider-Man scaling the walls with our hands. You see a lot of people with the flat of their palm go downstairs. This does not give you any stability. Furthermore, if you feel that you're about to fall, there's, you're not, you're sliding, you're not grabbing onto. Always want to have handrails. Storage height. I don't know about you, but I'm a very short or small person, I like to call myself. And so I make sure that things that I use on a daily basis, like mugs for tea, drinking glasses, dishes are lower. As we raise things up and we're reaching, our ability to balance is greatly reduced. So we suggest that anything that you're using, you put on a lower shelf. We don't want step stools and things like that. And you know, and if you're reaching up and you're on one leg and you're in an awkward position, again, it's gonna throw our balance out of whack. Daily activities that involve water. So I have a picture of a dishwasher here. So I can't see hands, but I bet all of you have unloaded the top rack of the dishwasher and had that little bit of water left on something that had a hollow, like a mug or a dish. And what do we do? We gotta shake it off, right? Now you're done with the dishwasher and you have enough water on the floor to trip. It takes very little water to have a slip and fall accident. So take a towel, blot those off, and let's not throw the water all over the place. Free and clear pathways, removal of wires and cords. We see this close to recliners and things like that where people are sitting, they have their computers plugged in. Make sure they're off to the side behind a chair. You can get Velcro um, cords that will nicely tidy up your cords and bundle them so they're not a chaotic mess like we see here. Hallway lighting. Hallway lighting is really important. A lot of people find that they have to get up and use the restroom in the middle of the night. We don't want to be in a rush, and sometimes we are. And in the middle of the night when we're half asleep, we're not focused on our body mechanics. And so it's really important to have lighting so we're not tripping. We can see where we're headed and getting back to uh, bed safely. And of course, the number one place for falls in the home is the bathroom. And so we see slippery floors where there's the tub, the shower, rugs, bath mats, and debris. Bath mats in the shower are very dangerous. They curl, they can catch our feet. Sometimes they can become unsuctioned and they are Petri dishes. They do collect a lot of bacteria. We do not recommend them. And I'll get into some other solutions. And when the floor is wet, again, we are at risk for falls. If you have rugs that don't have a sticky non-skid background, you need to replace them and get that because if you step out of the shower and you weight bear on a rug that has nothing to grip, it, you're basically skating across your floor. It's very, very dangerous. So we have our cute dog here with very cute booties, but we can't always have cute shoes on, right? We don't always have shoes on. We're not always in the perfect situation. So slippery floors, covering your feet with safe footwear is one, footwear is one solution, but there's a safer way, safer way because footwear does not address safe friction levels on the floor, the cause of most slip and fall accidents. So the National Floor Safety Institute, yes, I'm gonna go Bill my science guy and you guys here. Uh, so there is a National Floor Safety Institute that talks about friction levels for floor, residentially and commercially. So it's called the coefficient of friction or an SCF, a static coefficient of friction as it shows on the bottom of the slide. Every floor 
When there's water present, you lose friction levels. Simply stated, it gets slipperier. So a safe dry floor is considered to have a COF, a coefficient of friction of 5.0 or higher. But as floor surfaces become wet, the friction level drops, critically increasing the probability of a slip and fall accident. So how do you, how do you fix that? Well, I can get into how you can fix that a little bit later. I'll talk to you about some slip and fall solutions. So, you know, we live in a state where we don't typically get a lot of rain. We're not dealing with snow. And if there's some people that are joining us from a different state, state you know that rain and snow bring water into the home, slippery surfaces. So you can see here, as those friction levels go below, you're critically at risk for falls. And we have a lot of tile here in Arizona. We see it around pools. We see it in kitchens. It's, it's really scary. You know, you have people getting out of the pool and then tracking into the house. It's very dangerous. So what is the difference between, you can just hit all these because they fly in a different, uh, between a slip and, and Kristen's like our DJ today. Thank you, Kristen, I appreciate it. Uh, slips or slippery floor surfaces, spills, wet floors, ice and snow, rain, stairs and steps. And then trips, you see here a perfect example of uneven surfaces. You know, a lot of times we're not looking down, but how many times in Arizona, I know they're all over the place, you know, where you have an elevated sidewalk or curb, is something's uneven. Uneven surfaces are very dangerous. Sometimes for ladies who are wearing heels, they get caught and wedged into grates and things like that. Cords, cables, damaged walkways, entrances and exits. In and out of the garage, we have that little step up. Sometimes, you, you know, if you live in an older home, sometimes there's wear and tear and there's gouges out and things like that and stairs and steps. So I like to call this the inexcusable excuse list. So we'll just read these. It was an accident. It won't happen again. I'll be more careful next time. Falling, it's just a matter of bad luck. I'm not elderly, so I'm not at risk for falls. It was the dog's fault. I love that one. Even people that don't have a dog, I hear this all the time. Oh, I'm sure we had a dog in here somewhere. My 92-year-old mother is the one I'm worried about, not myself. So, and believe me when I tell you, I've heard every one of these. You've heard the dog chewed my homework where now we're adults and it's, you know, these excuses. So to talk to you a little bit about what we do, um, and, and Susie mentioned this, we, we are fall prevention home safety specialists and accessibility specialists. But what makes us unique is everything we do is clinical. We make recommendations based on what's going on with you. We deal with people that have traumatic brain injuries, neurological disorders, stroke, Parkinson's, or simply were just discharged because they had a knee surgery or any orthopedic issue, or they want to be preventative. Staying on the preventative edge of falls, as, the, as I call my presentation, intervention is prevention. You want to get ahead of things. You don't wanna wait till there's a crisis and you're floundering trying to figure out what's going on. So. We send out our physical or occupational therapist to do a free home safety assessment. They will look at your entire home. We have a wonderful checklist that they'll go through and leave with you. A lot of things you'll be able to do on your own or with your family members, moving furniture, slippery mats, addressing how your room's laid out, cords, lighting, things like that. And then there's gonna be some suggestions that maybe you can't handle on your own and we can help you with. So things like safety grab bars, bath safety, you know, a drop down shower for those people that are not balanced in the shower, it's best to be seated. And so the whole point of being seated is that you're not sitting, standing, sitting, standing, right? Trying to shower and sitting, there's a drop down shower head. Again, it's our job to help you think of the mechanics of what would help you be safer. And again, there's people that hold on to things that they shouldn't be holding on to. The shower's got soap residue, shampoo residue, and water. It's a triple threat for a fall. So you don't want to be holding on to surfaces in the shower. You want to have something stable like a safety grab bar. And by the way, not a suction grab bar. I get asked that a lot. Suction grab bars can come unhinged. They're very dangerous. And we don't recommend them. Uh, they're not stable surfaces. Um, anything having to do with, you know, ramps, accessibility in and out of your home and things like that. And we barrier free showers, anything to make you safe at home. 
And I told you, I promised you, we talk about floor safety. So we have a product, you know, you can't have rugs everywhere. It is not safe and it, it is just not something that we do. Uh, we're not going to walk from rug to rug to rug, right? So we have a product called a, a non-slip treatment. Basically, you can treat your floor at a, uh, a molecular level. You would never know it was on there until um, the surface is wet and you have that increased grab. It doesn't change the surface. Um, the important point is there's things that you can do to mitigate your risks um, that aren't always big changes that can make a big change in your ability to be independent. And I always tell people to reframe things because I have a grab bar in the shower. I have it for prevention because let's face it, if there's ladies on the call, we shave. And sometimes we're standing on one leg. Well, I can't tell you how many times I'm like wobbling because you're reaching for shaving cream, a razor or what have you. And so having a grab bar in my shower has made a big difference for me because we're not going to stop shaving. I mean, I guess we could, but, but again, when things start affecting your functional life, you know, as Susie spoke about, when they start making you so guarded that you stop doing them, then that's, that's time to go, hey, I need to make some changes. So these enhance your ability to continue to be independent no matter why you're doing it. It doesn't matter the reason, the goal, and the important thing is to be preventative. And a lot of people wait till there's a crisis and they're on Amazon and they don't know what they need. I can't tell you how many times we've been in a home, they ordered a bar. It wasn't an ADA compliant bar. It wasn't what they needed. There's a reason for size. There's a reason for placement. Um, you know, we've gone in and found bars completely across the shower where you're so much more risk because you're reaching, you're, it puts you at a balance, you know, balance issue. So there's thought behind what you need in order to be safe. And everybody is different. Everybody's needs are different and your solutions need to be different too. So we're happy to help out. We also have a lot of helpful information on our website. We have videos and I like to be a resource. So if there's something that I can be of assistance with, please feel free to reach out. I think on the next slide is our contact information. Um, there's some questions. We, you know, handyman, this is a, a question I get all the time. Why can't a handyman install my grab bars? I'm going to take a sip of water here. Excuse me. Sorry. I start to sound like peppermint patty after 30 minutes um, from the peanuts. Do you remember peppermint patty? Um, handyman are great at installing things, but handymen have no idea what's going on with you physiologically. They have no idea what's going on. If you have a diagnosis, do you, do you have neurological issues that are causing you visual problems? They don't know. Our team that we use understands what goes on based on our therapist recommendations for installation. So everything's clinically guided. Um, so my wife's not gonna be discharged from rehab. Can you have items in place prior to her arrival home? Yes, we can. And how do I know it's time to put safety modifications in place? Great question. Do you want to avoid falls? Have you had a fall? Are there areas in your home, based on what we discussed today, both Susie and myself, that put you at risk? How are you navigating the shower? Are you climbing over a tub? Should you be climbing over a tub? Do you have an assistive device that either is not measured properly or you don't have one? Has it been recommended that you use one? Have you had your vision checked? Are you having balance issues? So all the things that we both covered today let you know whether you know you would be what best suited for modifications in the home. And so you can find us at measurabilities.com. We're happy to answer questions, provide a free you know, home safety assessment from the occupational therapist who can help you teach you, help teach you how to be safe in the home. And I just want to um, thank everyone. We love working with Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona. They are at the forefront of so many things and certainly fall prevention this month is a fall prevention awareness month. The program coming up is amazing. I hope everybody will attend and, and thank you to Kristen and Susie for, for allowing us to participate.